just take this quickly out so that I can demonstrate the uh, fitting of a dental implant crown. So number one, when the crown comes back from the laboratory and we, uh, we take it out of the box, obviously we leave it in Curacept for a few minutes. Um, we get some topical anesthetic and we put it on in the mucosa because the pressure from the fitting can be uncomfortable to the patients. So we don't want to, we want to minimize the discomfort to them. We also warn our patients that there can be some pressure because it, it compresses the, mu the mucosa and stretches the mucosa. The circular elastic fibers expand and within a few minutes you see blanching of the gum turning into pink. If, it's, if it doesn't turn into pink then you might have a problem. Then we have, uh, you check that this screw, if you can see the screw in the implant crown, is that clear? Focus is good? Yeah? So there's the implant crown, that's the the hole, this is a screw retained crown, yeah? And we very carefully, obviously, bring it to the mouth. Sometimes we ask the patient to turn their head so that you can uh, prevent the risk of dropping it and seat it into the patient's uh, implant. Now, this is the trick. I usually hold it between two fingers to make sure that it feels seated and it's not rotating. It feels like it's locked in into the internal hex of the dental implant. And I start turning the screw. If I feel that the patient is in any pain, I stop. I check for blanching. So if you can come all the way around here. Yeah, so there's a tiny bit of blanching. This is because I just took it out. So it was already fitted and I took it out. So that blanching phase is gone. But as you'll see that because of the elasticity of the fibers, uh, they contract quite quickly. But then all it takes is to just gently nudge it back in. And she's had some topical anesthetic, so that should help. You can use the... Um, this is the bit that fits into the torque wrench. <coughs> Normally just use a screwdriver. Obviously at the back of the mouth sometimes the space is limited, but Patricia's okay with a short screwdriver, it's okay. I turn it finger tight, and then if you look at that, we take an X-ray to make sure that the, uh, that the abutment is fully seated. There's no rocket science to it, as long as you don't see spaces between the abutment and the internal aspect of the implant then you're pretty sure that it's seated. But there are some other tricks that I'll um, go over with you guys, okay? We check with floss to make sure that the contact's good. So this is a, this is a reasonable contact for me. Some resistance, but it clicks through. Um, I don't want it open, obviously, because you know the mucosa around an implant is very, very important that we maintain the health of the mucosa around an implant. So we don't want any food getting stuck there. Um, if you just turn slightly, Patricia, so this area here, um, which is the buckle space, this is an upper six, so there is a dip here. This implant was not placed by me. Uh, so the implant was placed a little bit to the palatal um, and that has contributed to this slight buckle dip here. However, within a few weeks that should improve and there should be a much more natural appearance of that. In fact, we'll ask Patricia to, to come back and show us in a few weeks time. So we've, fi we've checked seating, we fitted it. We then need to torque it down. Now, this is an Inno implant. It's a Korean implant that is very obscure. So the majority of implant systems, it's 25. For Ostem, it's 30 Newton centimeters, but the majority are 25. So I'm not going to uh, push that uh, screw beyond 25 because that could risk snapping the screw. So I, I push it, I insert the torque wrench and the torque wrench breaks at 25 Newton centimeters. Okay, that way you know that you haven't exceeded the torque for the dental implant. Okay, so we've, we've seated, we've checked contacts, we've had an x-ray to make sure it's seated. We've then torqued it down. We then do the occlusal check. So for, a de for, an, for a, uh, an implant crown, if you bite down, please, Patricia, that's great. And if you open. So what we have here is a slightly heavy contact. So it's, it's almost level with everything else, but implant crowns need to be slightly shy in relationship to, to the remaining teeth, because the remaining teeth, they squash in into the periodontal ligament. Implants don't, they're ankylosed, so we have to just relieve that a little bit, okay? So if you just stop recording. So if you can bring it over a little bit, please, Catalina. Bite down again, Patricia, that's great. So we have 
the very light contact. So Patricia's got heavy contacts generally. So we've created light contact with the with the implant crown. So we, we can see it's touching, but it's not marking it as heavily as the, uh, the neighboring teeth. Alrighty. Next step, I usually pop a cotton roll in and then we get some PTFE tape. So uh, there's a million ways to do this, but this is the one we've been doing here for uh, a couple of, a number of years now. You get some clean PTFE tape and this is to protect your screw head. So that should you choose to, should you wish to unscrew this crown um, as you are drilling through the filling that will fill the screw hole, you do not damage the screw head. You roll up some tape and just nudge it in, leaving adequate space for a composite filling. That's too thick. So I'm gonna remove that and just lessen the volume of tape in there. Can I have a pair of scissors? Thank you. Okay, so we need to leave adequate uh, space for a uh, just a composite filling. Leave it leaves like two, three millimeters because if it's too shallow, the patient may bite on it one day because it doesn't really bond that much to the uh, to the um, because it doesn't bond so well to the crown. Uh, you want to try and make, uh, give a good volume of, uh, of composite there. Don't worry, I'll do that. I'll do it. I'll do it. Get a tiny bit of bond. I use a tiny bit of bond. Some dentists don't. They think it's silly, but I like it because it gives me that sense of uh, bonding a little bit. And then for a posterior tooth, um, any shade will do. Uh, for an anterior tooth, most of our screw holes are palatal anyway, so again, any shade will do. Sometimes it's nice to have a shade that's slightly different from the, from the crown itself, so that you can locate it. So it's nice to be able to see it slightly. But one trick for locating uh, composites in implant, uh, screw retained implant crowns, is to shine the curing light at it, and because of the different uh, physical properties, between composite and zirconia, you'll be able to identify it quite easily. Alrighty, I just smooth that down, use a little bit of um, use a little bit of the bond again to smooth it off so there's no excess material. And then after I cure it, I'll occlusally adjust it again. Okay, now the, the, the session is not finished, obviously, until obviously the patients agreed to this. Obviously, we tried this in before. We had a bit of a discussion. It's not the most perfect crown, this one, but it's the best we could do. Um, but then the session's still not finished until you've explained to your patient how to clean around it. And I will demonstrate that uh, shortly. Once you've done the occlusal filling, you're probably gonna to wanna to check the occlusion again. So, if I can ask you, Patricia, to bite down again for me. And open. Yep, so we have contact again. We have quite heavy contact again. That's not uncommon for us to find that, obviously, because the people bite in different ways and so on. So we've gone back to heavy contact. So we need to do a bit more adjusting. Can you stop the video again? Okay, so cleaning around an implant crown is very important to explain to patients. So there are multiple ways. Nice big long bit of floss is obviously the best one. Get closer, please. Mm -hmm. So what we explain to patients is to go in uh, into the through the proximal contact and then to try and wrap the floss down into the gum area. You need to get really close in, please, Catalina, uh, especially around the buckle here so that patients are aware that an implant crown is different from a tooth. A tooth, the root is confluent and congruent or flowing with the shape of the, the crown. With an implant, it is an apple on a stick, okay? So I have to explain to patients that they need to go in a little bit, okay? They don't need to do this every single day because obviously you get some 
you get some hemidesmosomal contact between the um, between the mucosa and the underside of the zirconial crown. But it's nice to do it from time to time. Okay, so you go in. And look, can you see this one has moved forward quite a bit? Now, another one we do is we sometimes, for patients, often when they start to get gum problems, if they do get gum problems around their implants, we teach them this one. So they let go and then they floss it on both, through po both proximal contacts, and we do a little bit of a crisscross here. Yeah, this is, the, the, uh, the objective is disruption of biofilm, okay, as I'm sure you guys all know. Um, another technique is... So we always tell our patients that there is a possibility, or the probability, that they will get food impaction uh, in these uh, embrasures for a time until the mucosa grows, the gum will grow in form a papilla. Okay, there, is a, there are rules about how papillas form around dental implants. In her case, she's got good contacts, she's got good bone levels, so papillas will form quite rapidly. So, but we, we explain to patients about this and we show them how to clean with TP brushes and most of them are familiar with them anyway. Okay, and then like you said, that, that mucosa there should start to drape itself around the neck of the crown and look a lot more natural in a few weeks time. All right, you can stop now, thank you.